Welcome to episode 317 of Destination Linux. Destination Linux is a video podcast from the Tux Digital Network. If you're new to the show, this is a podcast that is perfect for all experience levels. Whether you're brand new to open source or a guru of sudo, this is the podcast for you. My name is Michael. I'm Jill. And I'm Ryan. And on this week's episode of Destination Linux, we will be discussing building an automated home, the open source way. Then we discuss an alternative to JetChat GPT that is currently in the works, and it's open source. Plus, we have our tips, tricks, and software picks. All this and so much more coming up right now on Destination Linux. So this week in our community feedback, we have some feedback from Will. And if you want to send in your own feedback, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash contact to get in touch and send us an email or join our forum on Discourse. We're also on Discord as well. Go to tuxdigital.com slash Discord to check that out. Now, Will has some feedback on a previous episode, and I picked this especially because the feedback was for you, Michael, and he what? wanted to give you a very hard time on your update cadence. Okay, he didn't. It was actually, it's a really nice email, and um, they're just giving some tips here. But I wanted to, like, spice it up. Okay, oh, I see. Okay, excited. okay, okay. Yeah, so I was worried Will, for a second, but I appreciate you. Like, Will had some suggestions that could help, some ideas for your update cadence. So for those who haven't seen that episode yet, what's wrong with you? And uh, But real quick. No judgment, though. The <laughs> idea is that... Michael does have a problem, even though on this show we talk all the time about the importance of updating. He has a problem with updating mostly because he does a lot of production work and he's scared. Yeah. He's very whoa, scared whoa. all the time. He's a like a little chihuahua, sits in the corner, shivers, Aww. barks once in a while, afraid of updates. That's when an update comes, that's what happens to Michael. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, he just yelps and it's Update. all scared. Updates. <laughs> so Will has some ideas, Michael, to help you get over this fear okay. and become the Rottweiler of updating. <laughs> <laughs> so Perfect. the first idea <laughs> is to your dog impressions are horrible. They're like Scooby Doo level terrible. <laughs> like I wasn't really I wasn't, bad. I, okay, I'll I'll work on it before we end this segment. How about Thank that? Thank you. Okay. All right, yes. Cool. Okay. You could use Nix OS, which Will says what they do meaning you can roll back to previous configurations and software versions really easily. Now, this one's really interesting because NixOS is kind of getting really popular to talk about right now. In yeah. fact, Martin Wimpress is out there on Twitter, and he had a really funny tweet saying, hey, I want to tell everyone how powerful NixOS is, but without sounding like an ex-smoker. Um, so <laughs> they, you know, some really funny stuff out there, but people are really liking this idea of Nix OS and you actually don't have to switch to Nix OS to use some of Nix's power. They have a package management system that essentially, I don't know, I guess the easiest way to break it down for people is if you think about flat packs and snaps, it's a kind of similar concept to that, except it's actually mm -hmm. a repository where you can roll things back. You can have multiple versions of the same software and you don't go into dependency issues where you have certain apps that update and they share a package, but one uses the older version, one uses a newer version. Some of that dependency problems that you can come across, you don't have those type of issues in NixOS. So that would be a solution that potentially could work for you, Michael. Yeah, maybe. That's, I mean, that's something yeah. that I could consider. And then you've got Silver Blue, which is kind of an interesting concept as well. Very similar mm -hmm. concept of this immutable operating system works well if you use flat packs for everything. Mm. Use Snapper with ButterFS. I used to use this when I used Arch, and it would let me revert if a Pac-Man update went sideways. Now, mm. I love this especially because it means Michael would run Arch again because he used to be an Arch user. He left the truth, and he has yet to left find the, the light truth. again. And we're hoping one day to accept him back, the lost little sheep, back into the Arch fold. I, I've kind of dabbled here, here and there about Arch because uh -huh, it's, uh -huh. it's kind of fun. It sounds interesting. Nick's kind of also... Nix is something that I think is really interesting, but there is a little bit of a problem with this sort of situation we're talking about. So okay. most of the solutions here are related to updating by changing distros. And I just right. wanted to kind of point something out. I don't want to update. Why do you think I want to change distros? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Like, if he's too lazy to ever hit the update <laughs> button, what makes you think he's going to spend the time 
exactly. to refresh his whole system. Good point. Exactly. Okay, I see. I see that. That's a that's an interesting <laughs> one. I don't I know mean, if I there's sh- any solution to that. You know. Yeah, uh, there's. It's probably like this paradox. You know. It yeah. Is. But I, I'm gonna work on it. That's why I made it my uh, New Year's resolution or whatever we said uh, to work on my updates, and I am. Not doing not it. doing that yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the year's not over. Yeah, Michael. I have so There's much still, time. <laughs> still time for you to fix it. Uh, the last suggestion they had, in case someone was similar to Michael but is willing to change some things that they do, is to set all of your tools up in a Nix Flake, easy to keep in a Git repo or distro box. That way, you have a known working set of your tools isolated from your system. Also means that you can test upgrading and only change over to the newer versions. Once you're happy, they work. Will, all oh, of these are fantastic cool. suggestions. Not for Michael, because it's Michael. <laughs> but for everyone else out there, yes. fantastic, <laughs> fantastic suggestions there. And the whole NixOS thing is getting so much hype right now that I'm going to be playing with some NixOS myself. Like, I got to get in there and see what all the hype is about. I was oh, yeah. looking through it yesterday, and I saw some cool things you can do with Docker and Nix. And so if you haven't checked it out yet, maybe you can join me in my uh, little... I don't know, learning experience, my magical school bus ride to Nix OS, whatever you want to call it, you can join me on that and we can learn about Nix and we'll bring it onto the show and talk about the it. The magic school bus ride. I like it. Yeah. Yes. I forgot what the name of that show was, but like, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah. The one you had to watch in school with yeah, yeah, a substitute yeah. was- teacher usually. <laughs> the best. Exactly. It was the best. Exactly. The schoolhouse rocks. <laughs> yeah. Was that what it was called? I it might have been. <laughs> But the this is a really good ideas, and I think that I, I do want to try out NixOS. It's been a few years since I played with it the, since the first time. But there's the idea of the Nix Flake. I never thought about that. That might be something that I would consider because I could just have all the stuff that I need to be isolated, have that isolated, and keep the OS updated separately. That sounds pretty cool. So yeah. I'll look into that more. But we're still I'm, I, the update system is going to happen. I'm going to update it. It will be. It, it's going to blow everyone's minds. They're going to be like, "Oh my goodness, you finally did it!" Yeah, yeah. This is happening, people. I can't tell you when, but at some point in 2023, it's going to be it's, amazing. It's, the it's solution's going to blow everyone's mind. It's, yeah, everybody's yeah. going to be like, "There's no hype behind that." They're going to be, like, "How did you do it?" Well, I I fresh installed and just started from there, probably. <laughs> yeah, but then yeah. a year later, you're now you're behind. Again. And then we're back to the same problem. Yeah. Like, I'm going to New Year's resolution. We'll bring for it back on. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm exactly. looking forward also to playing with uh, Nix OS, the the yeah. full distro. I've I've dabbled a little bit in the repository, but I haven't played with the full distro yet. So that's going to yeah. be fun. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. You know, it's also awesome. Mm-hmm. What's that, Michael? Linode. Linode is yeah. awesome, and Woo-hoo. they are a sponsor of this episode of Destination Linux. Visit linode.com/tux. That's Linode.com slash T-U-X and see why over a million developers trust Linode for their infrastructure. Linode provides solutions and services to accelerate innovation where you can build everything yourself or you can use their one-click apps from the plethora of options that they have in the Linode's app marketplace to deploy everything from Plesk and WordPress to Valheim and Minecraft servers. Linode Michael, even hold on. Hold on. We have what? to... This is breaking news here. Did you breaking know news. that... In the middle of this ad, we actually are using Linode for our new Jitsi server so our patrons could listen into the show. And it's actually faster and more stable and better than it's ever mm-hmm. been. And that's true. The Jitsi room is the best it's ever it been. It really is. Yeah. I didn't actually know that part. I knew yeah. about the first part. So when you said yeah. it, I was like, yeah, I was there when help you set it up. But yeah. then the other part, like I didn't know it was running faster. That's even better. And you know what else you can do on Linode? What, you can Michael? have your own VPN because they have VPN friendly virtual servers. So you can create your own secure connections over the internet, protecting you on public Wi Fi, keeping your data private. And if you're using public Wi Fi, you definitely need to have some VPN set up. Just, just pro tip right there. Don't use, don't go to like McDonald's or something and connect to their Wi Fi and just pretend that all your Wait. passwords are going to be good or whatever. Get your own VPN yeah. on Linode. And if that wasn't enough, every plan with Linode's uh, services come with awesome customer support. In fact, it's using like humans. Like real not, humans? Y- yeah, people who respond, not just random robot responses or that are canned messages. They're, they're going to answer questions 
like a person would if they read it. Crazy, right? So if you want to send an email or send a message on social media or even pick up the phone and call them, you will be able to have a response from a person. And that's just unheard of in, it really is. well, pretty much every in industry at this point. So visit linode.com slash tux to create your free account. Plus, when you use that URL, you're going to let them know that we sent you, which is, of course, good for us, but also good for you because you're going to get a $100 60-day free credit when you sign up for your account at linode.com slash tux. So again, go get started on Linode's awesome cloud platform by going to linode.com slash T-U-X. What we're here to talk about is home, building an open home. Like, who doesn't want to build an open home? And I don't mean you open your doors and let anybody in. How open do you want your home to be, right? I mean, as an open source home. So I want all the technology that I I love, but I want it open source. Because you see, I constantly have to deal with this. You know, Michael, I call you. I whine about this all the time. All the time. to be listening. (laughs) Well, well, no, just about this, Michael. Oh, this part. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, um, so when I, when I whine about this, you pretend to listen, you put the phone down, go do your work and come back and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah oh, yeah. he's still there. Okay. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. What I whine about to Michael <laughs> is, hey, I love technology. I want to have all this automation. I want to be able to clap and lights come on. I want to be able to speak lights. I want the Star Trek experience. I want my doors to go swoosh, swoosh. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I want all of it. Why would you want a door to swing when it could just open swoosh. magically? Swoosh. Yeah. yeah, we want it to swoosh. Yes, you want it to swoosh. And I can't have these things a lot of times because the solutions that do this stuff are privacy nightmares. Because, you know, I also EFF shirt here really am into privacy and security there. And I don't want really? something that's no, listening. We've never talked about that topic. Yeah. On this show before. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I'll make a few more episodes. About that. <laughs> Uh, not to get on that soapbox, but uh, the whole idea is I, I want both best of both worlds, right? I want that technology to have home automation, mm-hmm. but I want it to be open source where I don't have everything that's being said in my home being sent out to marketers and then being distributed to the world and all of that type of stuff. It's just that's what I'm looking for. That's ridiculous, right? When I'm reading the recipe off to when I'm cooking or something and I'm getting the ingredients list, I want them to be able to take that so they can send me a you know, list for like, you know, some kind of grocery store. Coupons for a green jelly, yeah, yeah, green exactly. beans. Exactly. Green it's going to be casserole. so great. You know, yeah. you just think, think of the possibilities, right? Yeah, they're endless. And I love <laughs> how all the privacy invasive stuff is like, so we can give you better ad recommendations. Yeah, this is to help oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> My goodness. Like, gosh, I didn't know y'all cared. Oh, so it's nice to have me. your refrigerator talk to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Sure. So this week, I wanted to bring up the open source option we have fittingly known as Home Assistant. It's a Home Assistant and it's open source. So that's the key part about this. Now, Home Assistant is an open source home automation tool. It focuses on local control and privacy. It's the second most active Python project on GitHub with over 8,000 contributors last year alone and has been in development for eight years. Why is this important? Well, if you're going to spend a bunch of money on some of this stuff, I started to go down this road a few years ago, and there was Z-Wave, I believe. Is Z-Wave, the, yeah, 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 the protocol. Technologies yeah. there. And this stuff's expensive. Like, it's not cheap to go and get... It's so much cheaper to have something that's subsidized by your data. So it's so much cheaper to go in there and buy a Google Voice or Alexa device that's 35 bucks because they're subsidizing it knowing that they're going to be able to sell a bunch of data off of you than buying something that they're not going to get that subsidy off of. So you're paying the true price for it. But to me, it's far worth it. But this stuff is very expensive. So if you're going to pick a solution, you want something that's heavily supported by the open source community. You don't want something in this case. I mean, every project probably starts out this way, but you want something that's got like one person working on it on the side sometimes because you're going to be spending a lot of money potentially over time. You don't have to do everything at once, but on building this out. So I love that this has so many contributors and the second most active in Python. Do you know how big Python is as a language? Like that's mm-hmm. that's huge, right? To be able to make I mean, that claim. Yeah, it's like the, it's like a, an anaconda size project. So. Oh, Michael. Gosh. Or a viper. What? Where? <laughs> What have you all been drink? Did you all drink before this show started no. and didn't invite me? Because no, we, be we, we only always we always invite you, Ryan. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. I don't believe you. <laughs> Home Assistant can run on things as small as a Raspberry Pi. 
which are kind of hard to get these days. I know. But if you have one, you can run on, on a Raspberry Pi or mm -hmm. you can build your own server, any variation of mini PCs, any of those type of things you can run Home Assistant on. And if you're not into building your own, they also have this really cool thing because some people just don't have the time or want or need to go build something and program it and all of that. They've got this Home Assistant Yellow kit and this essentially has all of the hats and boards and connections and M2 expansion slots all with a case and everything. You just buy this thing and That you're sounds like it was made go. specifically for me. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not super expensive either. There's a couple of purchasing options, but you get this yellow kit for starting about 124 bucks, I think, for yeah, that. And then you've nice. got a bunch of add-ons and things that you can get. But you also get to support company and it's a pretty cool looking device very small you can put it anywhere without your spouse getting mad at you which is uh, very important for me that is always important <laughs> yeah because you know i'm moving and well i drilled a lot of holes in things to put stuff up like my mesh network and things that i've had to patch this week and so i'm really interested now in my new home i'll be moving to and not destroying it uh with holes and things and building my own chaotic chaos of home I'm, I'm curious how you're going to be able to do this in this new place. I don't, you know, you're saying you don't want to like mess it up, yeah. but, ha but I, seeing how many things you install in your house, like it's quite <laughs> often, I'm, I'm very curious if you can use home assistant to kind of take care of these things. I'm hoping, right? Yeah. Like I'm hoping that I don't have to uh, drill through studs on accident and things like that when, when running holes I actually did that. Like, cause I need to drill a hole and there was a stud there. So I just, I just drilled right you through just that. Just go right through. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! It went right through it. You saw the wood run. coming out. <laughs> Listen, you got to do what you got to do to get those Ethernet wires run. You, you um, couldn't. You couldn't just move it like no. three, four inches. To then the I'd have to side. fill the hole I started and then start over there. Like I'm yeah. not doing that. I'm going through it. Like power, baby. <laughs> All right. So here are some things you could control with Home Assistant if you're thinking like, what are my use cases for this? Number one, you've seen all the light bulbs, though they're mm -hmm. stupidly expensive, a lot of these. But yeah. if you're into the whole light bulb thing and being able to turn on your lights, walk in the room like a boss, change the light colors, maybe at night when you're studying the purple or pink, Jill, or anything yes. else, you could do that with Home <laughs> When we do this show setup, I have to walk around and turn on the little green lights. But if I, I know it's yeah. so ridiculous, you have to you have to walk like five, six I'm feet. I'm out of from breath by the time exactly. I get back there. Yeah, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I use a remote <laughs> for mine. Oh, yeah, Jill, I, please see. quit shoving your money in our face, Jill. Please, <laughs> no. please, Jill. Not all of us are wealthy, okay? I have mine set up with some automation. Because yeah, I nice. have a, a light switch that I'm able to turn off my lights. So um, just to show, I'm, I'm a little fancy too, Ryan. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. yeah. I, I Why like, don't you guys I just start like... counting your money on stream in front of you? <laughs> yeah. you know? oh, I do like the Philips Hue lights, and they, they're uh, a lot cheaper nowadays. So they're much more affordable. <laughs> yeah, they're getting, they're getting better. But to me, yeah. it's like light bulbs. I'm used to being a certain pro I'm old. So I'm like, now that person's like, in my day, light Back bulbs were 50 day, cents. <laughs> yes, you know? exactly. I'm not paying $50 for a light bulb. But Back yeah. in my day, you get a light bulb for a quarter and a, and, and a nickel. Yep, it's true. <laughs> hey, you can, the size of a cat head. The, you can even get the, the size light bulbs of a cat that, head. that are not just smart and change the colors and turn them on, to, but have a speaker in them. And, the, and they don't sound too good either. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is, there's all kinds of different variations. Yeah. You control your thermostat. <laughs> Which this is a big deal, right? If you you finally get that perfect spot in bed, you're about to go to sleep, and then your spouse is like, it's too cold. And then you got to get yeah. up. and that, No, now I could just talk to it and be like, Michael, because that's what I'll name my AI. Turn up the temperature. Michael, turn down the temperature. Michael, make me a sandwich. Michael, like that type of stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 3D printing. So you could be just sitting on the couch and be like, you know what? I need uh, something to be 3D printed and yell it out and it will be 3D printed for you. I'm pretty sure it's a little more complex than that. Shut up, I, Michael. I would this is my dream. Need... Do not go in my dream. <laughs> but you can at least monitor uh, your 3D printer. Yeah, that's printer. true. Alarms and security systems. That's probably like one of the most nice. expected people, you know, the, the security system stuff. And, you know, there's other stuff like you, even just appliances that you could attach to it because they make these 
outlets that are like smart outlets. So you plug in anything and you're yeah. able to track whatever it is. So you could attach that to your home assistant. I mean, there's so many things that it supports, even water heaters, if you want to, or if you do like gardening and you have like, you know, some kind of sensor outside that for your garden, you could keep track of that. And what's pretty cool is that we have a patron with us that is a really, really into home assistant has this huge setup and he showed it to us um, a few months ago of how complex you can go with home assistant. And he did like a screen share showing his monitors and just switch the turn on the home assistant features. And there's like a massive dashboard where he could see oh, every room so and the, he could, he could turn the lights on like on the other side of the house from his computer. And it was like, in so many cool things. And then also like open the garage door from where he was. And like, it was, it's so elaborate. It was, it was very impressive. And it made me really, really want to do it. And then I asked him how long it took him to set it up. And I was like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. But you know, that type of stuff is Aww. set up over time. Like, yeah, yeah. He, he said it, you know, it was a mini. Because I don't want people to be dissuaded and be like, oh, it's, if it's so much time. Home Assistant is a really professional looking piece of software. Oh, yeah. yeah. Super easy to get started. I was started. not talking about how Home yeah. Assistant was, is hard to use. I was talking about how lazy I am. How yeah. Well, yes. We can't even get you to update, let alone automate <laughs> your home, you know, in there. But maybe because of the fact that a lot of this is, you know, for laziness, you may spend the time initially. So that you don't have to worry. Because so mm-hmm. even the moisture sensors here are a really important thing for homeowners because even you talk about your water heater, but also in your attic or other places, if you could put these moisture sensors around your home, you can really avoid thousands and thousands of dollars of damage oh, that's by oh, having yeah, that type with, of stuff. Uh, with with mold and mildew and that that could really help and these are big ha- problems. A, in fact, yeah. when I was looking for a new house, there was this thing that was going on where they were putting spray foam into attics and things. Yeah. And so one builder was like, "Yes, you want spray foam because it's an amazing insulation." And they even had the attic open, and you couldn't feel any air difference between the attic and the actual house. Like it was amazing. But then this other builder who didn't have it was like, no, you don't want that because there's a lot of insurance claims that when hail or something damages a roof, water gets in and it sits there on that foam and rolls down in between your walls. So you don't want it. And the whole time I was thinking uh, if I had home assistant, I could put moisture sensors up there and I would yeah. know if there was water things that had gotten in. Like there's all kinds of cool things mm-hmm. that you can do with all of this stuff. And that's why I'm really excited to have an open source option like Home Assistant that we can run into. Now, if you don't care about privacy and all that stuff, you can hook up your Alexa and your Google Voice and all of that and, well, be a disappointment to me and the rest of the world. But you have those options if you want to utilize No judgment, those. though. Or you could utilize Mycroft and something like that. Mm-hmm. And I've played with Mycroft a little bit. I even brought it to one of my local lugs. I used the PlayStation camera and stuff to Neat. be able to capture voice and things. And Jill, I think you've played with it some as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I sure have. You know, back in its early years, like in 2016. But at the time, it still was a work in progress. And it was a bit slow at reacting. But today, that that has all changed. In mm-hmm. fact, they just re- recently did a major update. And apparently, it's it's wonderful. And nice. so, you know, and I, like you, Ryan, I was, I'm concerned about privacy and I wanted to use Mycroft as a privacy friendly replacement for the Amazon Alexa voice assistant yeah, when that absolutely. was becoming all the rage. <laughs> yeah. I've actually been extremely security con- conscious about IOT and voice assistants in my home and generally choose not to use them. Same here. Uh, for this reason. Yep. And also there's another reason, because my Steve husband would prefer to turn on our light bulbs the old fashioned way. It's funny because I see patrons in chat yeah. saying the same thing. I yeah. prefer a switch. So Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I get it. And sometimes <laughs> I, I get what people are saying. The with simplicity that. of a switch. Simplicity, yeah. right? If something goes down or imagine if there's an update, you know, that goes awry and your lights start flickering everywhere. I wouldn't have to worry about that. That would that wouldn't happen to me. What? Yeah. Because I wouldn't update. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, you wouldn't fine. update. My bad. But I mean, yeah. you you don't want your home assistant or your your automated your home automation system not working for sure. You don't want like IoT woe is me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm looking for <laughs> uh, to use actually Worth the, it. Home, <laughs> the the open source home assistant 
here in my computer studio to turn on lights with my Hue lights, uh, to turn on power strips, and maybe even a computer or two using the Wake on LAN p- features. Yeah. So that that, that sounds awesome. like a lot of fun. So yeah, I could you walk in the room. It senses yeah. you. Turns on your computer for you. Yeah. That would be pretty awesome. Absolutely. I mean, if we're ever going to live in the Star, like Star Trek world that we all want to <laughs> be in, you gotta you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. There. They're also doing a lot of work with this project as well. Adding in, they Nabu Casa has hired Mike Hansen, the creator of Raspi, to lead the language integration. They have. Over 60 volunteers signed up to help submit sentences to build out home automation in 92 different languages. So That's crazy. They talked about this being the big thing this year in their blog post with Home Assistant yeah. about wanting to not only make the interface with text have multiple, multiple language support, but also the voice assistant portions around there. And they're That's hiring awesome. some really awesome names in it to get that done. So at the end of the day, I hope that you're a little excited for those of you who are willing to do some home automation for this as an option, because an open source option here helps to really alleviate a lot of the privacy concerns that I have. Plus, imagine if you're the victim of somebody trying to break into your home and you can mess with them and victimize them right back by locking oh. doors, changing lights, speakers. You could completely mess them nice. up to where they run yeah. out of your home because what you're you automated saying, everything. Yeah. You just... You're talking about creating your own home alone assistant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. Right? Good, Michael. Michael. Yes. Brilliant. Yes. Like, <laughs> yes, that is so good. Oh, awesome. That's what we'll call it when I write all the different traps and things that drop Christmas ornaments Perfect. on the ground or whatever. Yeah, we'll <laughs> Our patrons love that, Michael, Arian, and uh, Nico nice. Jet. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so if you're going to go all of these links to set up something that's open source and is secure, you're also going to need something to keep your passwords to all the different services safe. And that's why we recommend Bitwarden. And this episode of Destination Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash tux. A password manager or software allows you to have peace of mind knowing your online accounts are secure. Bitwarden provides you the tools to store all your passwords in a secure vault, auto-generate those passwords and usernames for you, and even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to. You can access your data across many types of devices like your web browser, using their mobile apps, desktop applications, even the command line. Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your device so you know you're the only person with access to your data. Go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started and you can do it for free. You do not have to pay for this, but once you start using Bitwarden, you're going to want to because it's only $10 a year and you're going to get a gigabyte encrypted file storage with that 10 bucks. You're going to get two-step login with YubiKey2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator, so the TOTP support, priority customer support for just less than a dollar per month. I mean, you, you got to. It, By the way- good. Michael, I had a situation, and I cannot remember the exact circumstances, but we're on a trip, and I could not get, because I was using like a headless system in a VM, and I needed my Bitwarden password, so it was the first time I actually needed to use Bitwarden in the command line, and it works really well. Like, it's really smart how they do it, and every um, command that you would need to be able to pull your passwords and things once you create the authentication system is is kind of posted after you do each command. So you kind of always have the list of commands to pull the different passwords and stuff. Really intuitive. I was really impressed with it. Go That's to bitwarden.com cool. slash T-U-X and get started. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring Destination Linux. I actually recently switched and got a new device. And the first thing I installed was Bitwarden because it makes everything else so much easier to do. Yeah. It's the, definitely the first thing I install on every machine now because mm. it's my access into the rest of the world. So, yes. In the news this week, we're going to talk about Chat GPT because, well, everybody talks about Chat GPT at this point. And it's a very powerful tool that people are finding some amazing uses for. And it has companies like Google even shaking in their boots. There's also many people complaining about the artificial limits that are being put on this particular tool and the lack of transparency. And the lack of transparency is exasperated since ChatGPT is not open source, which is kind of interesting because the company who owns it is called OpenAI. And you would wonder, well, why are you called open if there's no openness in your company? 
Well, Michael, that's a really good question because they kind of used to be from what I can uncover here. Like, and I went down this rabbit hole because first of all, I want to tell you, I freaking love chat GPT and my prediction that it's it going to cool. completely replace the search engine. I still 100% stand by because even if you haven't understood the power of chat GPT, just put this in your mind that in a search engine, if you want to search for something like, I don't know, what is the greatest AI ever written? And then it's going to give you results. And that's the end. If you want to ask it some details, it says Michael AI, of course, and you want some details on Michael AI. Now you have to rewrite that and say, you know, in your search engine, tell me more about what is Michael AI. Whereas in chat GPT, it's a constant conversation that you're con you're going through that's breaking down. So I don't have to switch or change the search or search on different sites or click different links that are going to give me information I don't want because it's a consistent conversation happening all the way through. And that's one of the most simplistic but powerful uses of chat GPT to kind of explain how amazing this is. But from what I can tell, chat GPT seemed like it was open source in a nonprofit company till... Post chat GPT-3, it seems like that's when the open source portion stopped. And then we have this nonprofit open source company that kind of is now for profit, it feels like, or they're moving towards that. And the code's not open source. So now if you search, is chat GPT open source? You're going to see that a lot of people originally when this first came out were kind of applauding this like, oh my gosh, it's open source. Look what open source can do. And it seems like the first few versions that led to four, yes, amazing, but now they're closing that down. And it happens to coincide with Microsoft giving them billions and billions of dollars. So Oh, it just happens to coincide. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Microsoft. For those who are listening to the audio on a version, I gave them a very, you know, disappointed stare. A yeah. very disappointed <laughs> stare there. Because Microsoft loves Linux and Microsoft loves open source. We yes. should, we should, oh, well, there's a, qu a quick correction with that, Jill. When you look at, when, every time my, uh, Microsoft said that for years, they never said Microsoft loves Linux. They heart emoji Linux. Yeah, they did the heart emoji. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think this, this is going to change all of our lives, much like the internet did. Oh, yeah. I, I really believe oh, yeah. this AI, it, and I know a lot it's, of people out there are going to argue cool. with the screen. Um, that, hey, this isn't true AI, this isn't true artificial intelligence, and there's truth to that. But this is the very beginning of something that I see as a revolution, much like when people were in their literal articles out there saying, the internet is just hype. Like when the internet was released, there were articles from these big newspapers and saying, saying it's overblown hype, it's going to die, it's going to go away, uh, because people weren't able to see where it's going to go. And I've spent a lot of time in this. I've used it to write reviews for businesses, research information for future businesses, pick names for businesses, torture Michael by sending the stuff to Michael and telling him <laughs> yeah. all this amazing Very stuff, much. design yep. t-shirts, fix and help me understand broken code, uh, make business decisions. Like this thing has already- Those are the worst because he sends me those business decisions and I'm like, <sighs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> They're so good. They're so good. Well, you know, usually you say all six of those are stupid, but the seventh one is good. So eventually it gets I'll it right. I'll say the seventh one yeah. gives me an idea of what could be better. Yeah, yeah, Like yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a nice, that, that you sent me like a list of things and it was all like just terrible. And you were like, these are good. Like, no, they're not. And you're aware of this. Like stop sending me well, this stuff. Well, that very specifically was- a name for a particular business we were helping somebody with. But yeah, sure. I'm terrible at marketing, so I thought they were all good. But one of them was really good. <laughs> one of them was deep. I was giving you the benefit of the doubt, knowing that they're bad, sending them anyway. Okay, but you so you bring up a really good point here, too, though, that a lot of people are using chat GPT as a fact checker. And that's yeah, an that's important wrong. warning here. Yes. <laughs> uh, chat GPT gets a lot of stuff wrong, like a lot. It gets a lot right. Yes but it gets a lot wrong. It's almost like the internet where there's a lot of misinformation. What? The internet has misinformation? <laughs> I know, Michael. I know. What? Crazy. Memes. <laughs> so I do want to warn people, like if you're using chat GPT and I'm talking about how awesome it is, just make sure you understand that. But then you've got Google Bard as well because Google went on red alert when G chat GPT came out. Microsoft's like, hey, we're incorporating it into Bing immediately. Google has this Google Bard project they're releasing that's an invite list only. I know some of our patrons have gotten into it. So my point is all of the companies have dumped a lot 
of their money and budget for the next few years into this technology and have pulled back from AR VR in a lot of ways, but are pushing this. Cause I think this mm-hmm. is kind of the precursor to AR VR really taking off. Um, so do we have an open source alternative to this? Cause right now, and I think there was just, I don't know if this is verified, but there was somebody who said that the everything you've asked chat GPT got leaked, which is the side conversations. Somebody was scraping them. So it's not private. Oh, wow. I don't I haven't verified that, but that was something I saw on a tweet or something go across. So, you know, keep in mind that because it's not open source, at least anymore in things, there's a lot of security issues that could present. So if you're asking something you didn't want other people to know you asked, well, that stuff might get out there. Um, and the same reason we want open source alternatives to Windows and Mac, we want one for AI. And that is where I think Open Chat Kit by Together by together. Oh, yeah. that's so sweet. We're all so together. sweet. Comes so in. We we work together. We work <laughs> yeah, together. So in oh. addition, they have trained models that any developer can use to create an AI powered chat bot in the open chat kit, which is the framework to create AI powered chat bots that's out there. They're also collaborating with other research organizations, including Leon and Ontocord. I don't sure. know what those are, mm-hmm. and I probably mispronounced them, but they probably, sound important. But we're close to enough. create data set containing more than 40 million questions and answer examples called open source instruction journalist data sets. So Rolls right the, the, tongue right there. the key here is that we have a potential for a true open source alternative to chat GPT. But yeah. my fear is that this technology is going to have so many billions of dollars thrown at it that will an open source option be able to keep up with what's going on with the corporations? Now, we obviously can say we've kept up with Microsoft, we've kept up, but many years we were behind before we caught up and surpassed. So is this a situation where if we don't get people, which is why I wanted to bring it up on the show, thinking about this now, getting involved in this now, that we could fall really behind these corporations. And I think it's really important for people to know ChatGPT is not open source. Because I remember when it first came out, everyone was talking about, oh, it's open source. It's open source. Mm-hmm. It's open source. And it's not. It's not anymore. So Yeah. that I mean, that's very dis- disappointing that they may, went proprietary with it. But it's also an it, interesting point you made about is the open source project going to stay, you know, is it going to fall behind? Are we going to have to deal with all of these companies pushing so much money into it that they just, you know, jump so far ahead and we have to play catch up. And in the open source world, a lot of people are familiar with the idea of playing catch up. And this is something I think is great because they're doing it so quickly in the True. creation of the the mass adoption of interest in chat GPT or just these kinds of like AI chat bots and stuff like that. The fact that they're doing it so quickly, I think there's a lot of potential for that. And hopefully, by doing it in, in like an open source approach, it will make other companies who want to con- create their own but are not going to be able to like fund it themselves have a collective effort into this. That would make it a much more viable option in the future. Here's the fear with ChatGPT. So ChatGPT now has a $20 a month subscription option, which I have no problem with. Obviously the servers have crashed multiple times just trying to keep the thing running because so many people were utilizing it right now. So I have no problem with them making money, even if it was completely open source project on it. But some of the features like the plugins, which allow things like uploading files and things for it to be able to scan and utilize its AI logic against um, being able to, for instance, uh, connect to various social media sites and things and be able to pull certain information and stuff that you want. These very, very powerful features and tools and plugins that people are creating are behind that paywall right now. So if you don't pay the $20 a month for that, then you don't have access to that. Now, why is that a problem? Well, when we talk about Linux and open source, one of the amazing things that Linux and open source does is it closes the digital divide. You have this person who's an amazing potential to be an artist, but they don't have the funds to pay Adobe and other things hundreds of dollars a month or thousands of dollars a year to pay for these packages. So we have these open source alternatives so that child can become the artist that they wanted, even though they weren't born into uh, mass amounts of money like Michael, for instance, when he shoves his money in my face like he was. 
or Jill, for instance. <laughs> false. What were we false. talking about with that when you guys were shoving your money in my face? Was it a cup the, you were using? No, the, we're, water? We, were talking about, we were talking about the lights. Uh, the like, yeah. lights. That's <laughs> what it is. Yeah, we yeah. have switches, and you have this your ability to walk to them. <laughs> yeah. Lame. Yeah. Lame. Yeah. 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 You guys were showing your so fancy lame. remote controls. Yes. Um, but the the key is now think about a kid who is doing homework or college assignments or other things that has access to Chat GPT that can upload the coursework. They can upload the book from the course and be able to get the, the small portion of information that they need from an AI versus a kid who doesn't have those resources and money to do that is now going to be at a significant disadvantage because AI is here. It's going to change the way we go to school, college, all of that stuff. And so that's why, again, having an open source alternative is so important because the corporations mm -hmm. are going to put this behind paywalls. You, They were giving away searches for free up until now. But chat GPT and these other things are going to cost money to do it. They found a way to monetize it. And I think that it's going to be a big division between people who have money and not that's going to come as this stuff gets more and more powerful. Yeah. You know, another reason, and even though this is fiction, it, it's still scary to think about. Another reason that I want chat and AI to be open is because I don't want the T-1000 robots r roaming around <laughs> our neighborhoods. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that is a fear for the future, for everyone. And yeah. it seems far-fetched, but it is actually a fear. And if there's one organization controlling that, then, you know, stuff like that can happen. And that, we that's why we need... We do not need Skynet. Yeah, we Sorry. don't need Skynet. That's why we need open <laughs> we need open source to keep it balanced. And it's, yeah. our, it's our system of check and checks and balances. Well, I was taking a course in AI this week, and there was a portion in the course that was kind of applying, of studying this and referencing it to Moore's Law applying to AI. And they stated that in, from an AI perspective, where we're at today, we've surpassed the brain of an insect, and we're currently at about the processing power of a rat. And yeah. the thought is, while we might double every few years our capability, it will be 2025 to 2030 before we're able to be at the human brain level. So that's not very that's far, not far off no. at all. It's probably maybe more towards the 2030 timeframe, but that's still not even far away at all to be at that. So when you think about what that's going to mean for people and what we're going to be utilizing this for, we got from the insect to the rat in about four years from an AI perspective. So this is going to be a huge advances are going to come. And the ability to separate people who have access to this against people who don't in the future for their jobs and other things is going to be a massive difference for people who wouldn't have access, which is why I think it's so important that we have this open source option. Now, Jill, you got to play with mm -hmm. Open Chat Kit's demo a little bit. Yes, Now, I you sure gave did. it some very simple tasks <laughs> that uh, it did pretty well at, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I I asked Open Chat Kit the the demo, explain what the Destination Linux podcast is, and it answered the Destination Linux podcast is a weekly show hosted by the Destination Linux team. We must kill yeah. it. It's too powerful. <laughs> too powerful. <laughs> but this is what was interesting, and and check this out. So I typed in who is Jill Bryant podcaster. It answered, Jill Bryant is a podcaster and blogger who has been involved with Destination Linux since its inception. Hmm. This, of course, is not completely true, but I was a listener of DL <laughs> back when it started. It but, lies. But it, it lies. lies. I've, I've, I have been a host for a few years, but th this not is not completely true. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> we, actually, none of us were since the yeah. inception. <laughs> I would be the closest out of everybody. Yes. But yeah, yeah, yes. I are. still wasn't even here since the inception. <laughs> um, no, this is really interesting. This proves the point, Jill, like I said, that, you know, this thing can make it seem like it ex knows exactly what it's talking about, but doesn't. Yeah. And there's some real risks here with misinformation for people. And that's why there's a lot of limits put on even chat GPT right now, which a lot of people were screaming it's a transparency issue and things. Um, but there's a lot of limits because they don't want it to be trained the wrong way. You know, people love to uh, try to do nefarious things with this type of stuff. And so they've put a lot of limits. But there are people who have access to an unlimited version of ChatGPT where it has no limits that are artificially put on it. 
And what does that mean for them? I mean, we don't know. We don't know what the true capabilities of chat GPT are when you remove all the limits and restrictions in there. And I think that's why getting involved from an open source standpoint where we could start to understand those things are important. I think we've got a long way to go to, to catch up, but if anyone could do it, the open source community can. Mm -hmm. So Jill, I gave you talking about simulations, AI, robots, all that stuff. I found the perfect game for this show, I think. It's called Durka Simulator. Uh, how did you enjoy <laughs> Durka Simulator, Jill? It, it was, it, it has a really good story, a little rudimentary on the graphics, <laughs> but it has a really good? good story. Yeah, I, I think it was fun for a free game. Hey, you know, you can't complain, it's free. You can absolutely complain. <laughs> yeah. you, can, you can totally complain. <laughs> I so, mean, <laughs> what do you mean, Michael? <laughs> for, the, for those who are watching the not watching the video version, check this out in the in the links in the show notes. The graphics of this game are they <laughs> remind me of like what you would have if you gave MS Paint to a four year old, mm. yes, and it, they just started <laughs> randomly drawing things. Yeah, that's that's how what it kind of reminds me. And also, Beautiful. there's a part where it's like representing you or whatever, and it's just a question mark or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, it does have over uh, 1,600 overwhelmingly positive reviews. So I don't know how, but I'm, <laughs> I'm very interested to know why. <laughs> Although some of the reviews, yes, are very sarcastic. It's like some of the reviews, Michael, are Durka game is best game. Yeah. Like, are, I think a lot of people are just in on the joke a little bit. I yeah. like that. Uh, one one review is Masterpiece. That's it. By Masterpiece. Yeah, Masterpiece. Masterpiece. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a free game, so it's not like you're losing anything to no. play it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> so the main character is named Mickey. And Mickey, the poor guy, just wants to enjoy his apartment and play on his PlayStation while avoiding homework from college. Instead, he is told he is being arrested because he has an ancient power and an <laughs> unknown person is trying to protect him. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is every eight-year-old's imagination. Oh right yes. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, honestly, it is, you know, the story is fun and it's a well-done visual no novel, again, despite the uh, clip art backgrounds and the, and the stick figures. <laughs> but oh it's, my goodness. it's uh, well put together. And good transitions, and thematically, it's really nice, and the music is good. So. God, I wish I had Jill as my professor. <laughs> you know, like she would be able to see the, the see Give something so much. positive <laughs> yes. about the terrible work that I would be turning in. You know, Jill always <laughs> finds the positive in something. I mean, look, like Michael said, you can't really lose. It's free, so mm -hmm. go check yeah. out Durka Simulator and see. So you can find out who is the who is behind the ancient power of whatever I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so mysterious. So mysterious. <laughs> well, listen, if you want to create a game like this, then our software spotlight might be perfect for you. It's called Stable Diffusion <laughs> Online. Now I, we Can't mentioned be how much worse. <laughs> fun I've had playing with Chat GPT <laughs> and even torturing Michael with some bad marketing ideas prompted by Chat BT, uh, GPT. Uh, that I forced Michael to weed through. I even sent pictures yeah, to Michael. Yeah, he tortures me with this now, too. <laughs> yes. As soon as I found this, I started making certain paintings, one of Michael That's with weak thumbs. Yes. And uh, Michael <laughs> refuses to show them. I said, please share this to our amazing listeners who we love so dearly. And he said, and I quote, this is it. No. Yeah. That's all I said. <laughs> this is it. That's all no. I said. No. That's I true. All I said was no. <laughs> yes. yes. But if you want to try to create images of Michael's weak thumbs, then I suggest you go to Stable Diffusion Online and you can do utilize this AI generation tool to create text to image diffusion models. It's capable of generating photorealistic images given any text input. Out you know what's also interesting in this, Ryan? You could use this to make something, you know, useful rather than nah. just the weak thumb nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> <laughs> this empowers billions of people to create stunning art like of Michael's thumb in just seconds. And stunning. It was a little disgusting. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, it was it, the photo, the video, the photos he sent were just weird. Yeah. And Alex, they, it, uh, the fingers and hands were all, all deformed. And, yeah. Uh, it, it didn't quite know how to generate them right. But this is the future, Michael. This is the future. It's going to get better. <laughs> and if you have the artistic eye of, say, me, uh, you can become the next Picasso by just using this tool here. So. <laughs> Like uh, so. people make fun of my art, not any longer. <laughs> I just throw my idea out there, and poof, the art will be generated. No, One they'll day, still not make today. fun of it. Okay. They'll still make fun of it. It's just you don't have to worry about actually doing it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now it's this is fully level. open source and explicitly falls under the CCO 1.0 Universal Public Domain dedication. So open your favorite browser window and start creating art. Well, I had fun with it, Michael and Ryan. I typed Linux Love in Stable Diffusion Online and got this really cute picture of a penguin, a blobby-looking white penguin with uh, computer circuits in the background. So, you know, it was fairly accurate. <laughs> it, it can do some things that yeah. are okay, you know. Yeah. Unless and Ryan's I'm, doing it, and then it's like... Then it's just even more beautiful. <laughs> 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 All right, so let's talk about the tip and trick of the week. So the tip of the week is, well, some people prefer the simplicity of Nano, but never yeah. really take the time to learn all of what Nano can do because there's some nice shortcuts that can make your usage of Nano even better. And Nano can be quite powerful with these shortcuts. So today we're going to be talking about these Nano shortcuts. So first of all, you can quickly save and close. Save with Control-O and close with Control-X. You also have the ability to cut mark text or line with control K, and you have this thing called pasting text. And I know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. It's not control, control V. <laughs> yes. it's, uh. it's control U because uh. reasons of legacy computing from like the 70s where they had control V associated to page down. Yeah. And for some reason, mm -hmm. it's universally page down to have its own key whereas control V is now forever can, like pasting on everything else but in the terminal not so much and including mm -hmm. nano so if you want to paste that's control U control W is find because naturally and alt W is <laughs> wait find you're talking next. about the power of yeah. nano but you're making fun of its shortcuts i'm not i I'm call foul <laughs> I'm hey, not making hey, fun it's of the still shortcuts. still easier than Vim or I'm Vi. Saying, I mean, you know. <laughs> that's true. Oh, that's Jill, very don't true. Don't ever say that. The Vim and <laughs> Vi people are vicious. Yeah. Oh, I love Vim and Vi. S send your hate I, mail to Jill. At no. <laughs> yeah. I, I but, use uh, Vi actually probably more than Nano. Yeah, Vim and Vi people are vicious. They got teeth and they're, they hop and they're bunnies and Money <laughs> Python reference. Money Python reference, you know? like Yeah, they're anyway. bunnies. Yes. Uh, good, to know. good to know. Their teeth are this long, and yeah. Yes. Anyways, well, the, I, I was more like more talking about the fact that Nano has these shortcuts, and it's very good that these shortcuts yeah. are there. But also, you 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 do need to learn what they are because they are specific to the old way of computing, and they're the things that you're going to expect to be able to do. It is not going to do it that way. Control slash for search and replace. I mean, that's that's a powerful. Yeah, one. it's very useful to have it. Also, it's still like a weird, a weird shortcut. Yeah. Shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. That's our weird show for you this week. A big thank you to each and every one of you for supporting us by watching or listening. However you do it, we love your faces. Join us on Discord, tuxdigital.com slash Discord. And if you want to watch the show live, you need to become a patron of Destination Linux and you can join us recording live Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern. In fact, we have our glorious patrons with us right now in the patron-only stadium where it's a 60,000 square foot virtual stadium where there's like the all the luxuries and amenities you can possibly imagine are in this stadium because they're they're virtual amenities, but you know, they're there. And they get to watch the show live, but also if, if you're a patron and you can't make it live, you can still watch the show in its all of its glory and the glory. unedited version of the show, glory. which is posted right after the show is completed. So patrons can check it out. Even they, first of all, you get the unedited version, but you also get it quicker because well, glory. It, takes, oh, it takes time oh. to edit. 
Yeah, oh, because is. of the glory. Exactly. <laughs> because of the glory. You can also join us in our patron-only post show that happens every week after the live show. So you can do all of this by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute and becoming a patron of the Tux Digital Network. And if you want some awesome swag like the swag I'm wearing and the swag Jill is wearing, we can get a, the DL shirt or the Linux 91 shirt or Ryan is completely dropping the ball this week and doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's also not there on the Eco. store Ryan oh. but you can go to tuxdigital.com slash store to check out some really cool swag we have t-shirts hoodies mugs stickers coasters hats and so much more so check it out tuxdigital.com slash store and make sure to check out our wonderful shows here on Tux Digital we have the Pseudo Show This Week in Linux the DOS Geek Channel Linux Out Loud Hardware Addicts GameSphere and our virtual Linux user group Linux Saloon so everyone head to textdigital.com and subscribe to all these awesome shows. And don't forget to leave a rating on your favorite app so others can discover the awesome power of open source and keep those penguins marching and the full Monty of Linux and open source awesome sauce. Everybody have a great week and remember that the journey itself is just as important as the destination. Thanks, everyone. We love you. One of our patrons See in here week. just said they want a shirt that says 20% less Ryan. You know what? <laughs> If you buy it, we'll put it up there.